I showed you a bit of the movie Encanto before worship began. And it, the movie begins with this girl who is getting ready for the big day in their household when each of the children get magic and her littlest cousin is going to get his magic. And so the town kids are following her around as she sings about how wonderful her family is, describing the magic that comes to them all. And the kids keep asking her as the song goes on, well, what's your magic? And she will tell them about each of her siblings and her aunts and uncles and her grandmother and what magic they have. And then the kids will ask, but what is your magic? And she doesn't answer. Until finally, people start answering for her, saying, she doesn't have any magic. She doesn't get the special gift that everybody else did. She went up to the door that provided the magic, and nothing happened. The story in Kanto is a story about sort of the pain and hurt we carry around within ourselves. For Mirabella, Mirabella, the little girl, that pain is that she didn't get to be part of everything else that the family was. She didn't give that gift. She didn't get to become who they were expecting her to be. And when she tries to discover what's going wrong, she gets left out of things. Because she isn't part of the way the family is supposed to be. She isn't included in the big family picture after the celebration. When she tries to find out about what seems to be going wrong with the house and with the magic, she learns about the pain of the others in her household. She learns that her older sister has been carrying the weight of the world on her shoulders because everybody expects her to always be there, to always be there to serve and help them. And she learns that her other older sister has been considered perfect has to always make flowers bloom wherever she is, pretty, beautiful flowers. And then she discovers that her uncle, who has disappeared, had made a prophecy about why the magic would fail. And when he made that, people sent him away. And that's where the that song that I played earlier comes from. Because she wants to find out more about Bruno. And what we learn in the story is that we don't talk about him. We don't talk about him. He makes us uncomfortable. His disappearance makes us uncomfortable. We don't talk about him. How many of us have a pain? like one of those siblings experienced. Feeling that we have to carry the weight of the world. Feeling that we have to be perfect. Feeling that we just don't belong. I wonder if that in that story today about Jesus, we have that same sense of being lost and feeling as if we don't belong. Because before we had doctors, but even today, those who are different because of illness are treated differently, are put away and hidden, aren't talked about. And so this man who has been paralyzed is brought to Jesus by his friends. And his friends, while they get up on the roof, they pull it open to lower him. And I wonder as they're digging through that roof whether they heard the words of Jesus and what he was saying, what he was talking about. Was he speaking like he did in the beginning of Mark with his 
six-word sermon, repent and believe the good news. Did they hear him talk about forgiveness and repentance, about turning back to God, about rediscovering what it means to be in relationship with the holy, and when you do that, how the world begins to change? Did they hear that? And then when he's lowered, as he think, he's been thinking about what it means to turn back to God, Jesus looks at him and says, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. What does he hear when he hears those words? Did Jesus touch that painful part of him? Did Jesus hear what was inside, that story that hurt? Did he name the pain that he had inside? Because honestly, when Jesus said those words to him, he should have said, well, what happened? Were you always like this? Have you always been paralyzed? Did you have an accident? But instead, what he saw was the hurt. And he named the pain and the regret, the fear, and said, your sins are forgiven. When Desmond Tutu talks about how we move through the power of forgiveness, he tells us that we start by telling the story. In other words, we share all the details. We tell the who, the where, the when, the why. We tell the story in all its fact and truth. But he says it's not enough to tell the story. Because the reason you're telling the story doesn't get to the pain, the heart of it, the truth of it. I think about this and I think about the stories that I sat with with my grandmother in her last few years and with my dad in his last few years. My dad would tell the story of being so angry with some kid at school because they were picking on someone else that he hit him and hit him and hit him. And he told us, never to let the bullying happen. But because he had gotten dementia at that point, I'm the only one who heard the real story because I had asked him at some point, why did he become a minister? And he told me that he always felt like he needed to protect the younger dog. And that when that happened, when he was so angry, and my dad's a big guy, like he was 6'2", and he's built like a football player. Like my dad isn't a little guy, he's he was a lineman. So when he would tell that story, he was expressing his pain and regret, his hurt. And it was part of his story about why he became a minister, about how he told himself that he would never get that angry again, never get that mad again. My grandmother's story, the pain that she shared in those last years of her life, or a couple. One of them was about how they lived in Connecticut, and this is the time before people were allowed to have birth control in Connecticut. It was declared illegal and you couldn't have it. We're not talking. Um, Abortion, we're talking birth control. This is before Griswold versus Connecticut. And when one of my older aunts and uncles got married, she told me the story about taking them to New York to get them birth control. And this is from my grandmother who only ever drives down the street to the store and back to the farm. Never goes anywhere else unless they're going on vacation and then she just travels to Rebel's house. <laughs> and so, she told that story over and over again about taking my aunt to New York to get birth control. Because every month in her mail showed up the request from Planned Parenthood for money 
And she wanted me to know why it was so important to give money to Planned Parenthood. How important it was for people's lives. She shared that out of her own pain about having seven children, and on the seventh one, she told the doctor, you better stop this. Because there weren't any other options. Our elders, when they reach that point in their life at the end, they tell us their story of pain. But we have to have the ears to be able to hear it. Because what they tell you is the facts. They tell you the truth. They tell you the who, why, where, and when. They don't tell you the hurt. And Desmond Tutu says that the only way we can move into forgiveness, it's okay, <laughs> is to name the hurt. To name that pain that has been holding us back. Because until we can take that story and share where it's hit us, has it given us shame? Has it given us fear? Has it given us discouragement? Whatever that emotion is, until we can connect with that emotion, we can't move forward. And I think that's what Jesus' story teaches us, too. That everybody saw that he needed to be healed, but what he needed, he needed his pain seen. He needed his hurt recognized. He needed people to experience that he wasn't just a cripple, that there was more there to him. And Jesus saw that, acknowledged it, and changed his life. In this process of forgiveness, sometimes we're the people who need to share the story and get in touch with our emotions, and sometimes we're being the people who listen, who hear the pain and just sit with it. Tutu describes how he had to do that a lot when he was so angry and wanted to fix things. Because someone had been killed in her, his daughter's house, and his daughter had found the body in, in his granddaughter's room. And he had to just sit and listen to the story, because there was nothing he could do to change it. But what he could do is hear her move through the process of grief over how their lives had been dramatically changed by that random act of violence. So sometimes that's our job, to just listen, to sit there with people in the pain, to sit there and hear them as they name their hurt. Because Maribel does that in a concert, because in Maribel hears everybody's story of pain, finds everybody's place of hurt. She is able to heal the family, to bring them back to the magic that has inhabited them. She's able to bring the family back to the beauty and wonder that was their ability to share and survive horrible trauma. So I invite you to think about this. Where do you need to stop? And tell your story. Tell the story that is hurting you. Where do you need to stop and name what the hurt is, what the pain is, so that you can move forward into that beauty of forgiveness?